Hey, in the last two videos, we talked about what CS deformation is and how we can observe it with satellites and buoys. I'm Luisa von Eibel, a PhD student at the Alfred Wegener Institute, and in the following, I will present you the recent findings on CS deformation during mosaic. You wonder how this presentation got its name? The ones of you who participated in mosaic probably remember the various times when the opening of a lead or the formation of a pressure ridge forced us to relocate a part of the camp. Those events displayed here in this figure did not only cause trouble for the logistics, but also had a strong impact on the ocean, atmosphere or biological processes that we were capturing by our measurements. Let's have a look at how deformation looked like during mosaic derived from satellite data. In this animation of several weeks, lines of strong deformation are displayed in bright green, while the ice without deformation is shown blue. The mosaic flow is in the center of the 50 km circle. Looking at those well-defined lines illustrates that deformation varies often by two orders of magnitude on small spatial scales. The same is true for the temporal perspective. On a daily base, the appearance of a deformation zone can change. This raises the question how we can actually upscale local measurements. Just imagine you have done an observation on March 27. At that time, a shear zone has crossed the mosaic flow and affected the processes at your measurement site, while most of the ice in the wider region remained unaffected. Since deformation events can have such a strong impact, we might need to consider where and also how often such an event took place before we can upscale the local measurements to a larger region. My aim now is to show you that the local deformation in a radius of about 5 km was representative for the deformation in the wider region. To do this, we will study this time series of divergence from the direct vicinity of the mosaic flow. All negative numbers refer to convergence, so the formation of pressure ridges, while the positive ones describe divergent events when leads have formed. In the middle of the time series there is a gap, because then the mosaic flow was too high up north to be seen by satellites. Looking at this time series, we can identify roughly four periods in which deformation reveals similar patterns. Those periods are related to the properties of the ice pack, mainly how consolidated the ice was, because this influences how easy it breaks. So during leg one, in the autumn period, when the ice was still quite mobile, we had several strong events, often in connection to strong storms. When the ice was strongly consolidated, so in the winter, it was more quiet and leg two had a really good time. In March, the ice pack broke up several um, by several storms and the newly formed deformation zones did not really consolidate properly. In the last, in, then in the last period the ice was more mobile with a clear dominance of divergence, so the ice was moving apart from each other while the mosaic flow approached the ice edge. Now we can add in orange the deformation time series from the surroundings. All orange dots represent deformation in the 50 km circle. Doing statistics shows that the deformation time series of the mosaic flow was representative for the deformation of the wider region. On average, the mosaic flow experienced as many exceptionally strong events as the flows in the surroundings. However, the large spread of the orange points also makes clear that this is only true at the whole time series and not for individual events. And as you know probably better for your own measurements, a lead in summer can have a different effect than a lead in winter. Therefore, it is possible to upscale the local measurements, yes, in respect to deformation, but it is also important to take into account the effects of different seasons, time and also the different scales. Talking about temporal scales, deformation is also really localized in time. This means opening up a lead can take uh, place in a few hours, followed by a rapid closing of the lead right after it. Satellites with repeat cycles of a day often miss those details. GPS buoys sending their location every 30 to 60 minutes allow us to reconstruct deformation at a higher temporal resolution. Such a time series is displayed here, where black indicates the daily mean and gray the hourly values. First thing you might notice is that the high resolution buoy deformation breaks through our y-axis limits. 
The hourly values are much larger than the daily values because, as described earlier, deformation often fluctuates quickly between divergence and convergence. This effect is then averaged out when taking a daily average. The buoys have another advantage. They don't have a gap. On the other side, they cannot provide us with high spatial resolution as the satellites can. Therefore, we combine information from both. This version of the plots shows um, now the buoy and the corresponding satellite derived deformation. There are parts where they agree really well, while they deviate, especially in the summer months. Here, a combination of small differences in spatial coverage and increasing uncertainty in the SAR data has most likely caused the deviation. And yes, putting all together it leaves us with a really messy graph, but also with a complete picture of deformation on different spatial and temporal scales. Let's go back to how all our research might benefit from those results. First, we can use deformation to calculate lead opening rates. In the 20 km distance to Polarstern, this was 4% on average per day, with peaks up to 15% sometimes. Those numbers could be used to estimate heat and gas exchange, new ice production and brain release. On the other side, we can also calculate ridge formation rates that were 3.8% on average. This could be used to estimate the volume of ice that was reworked and stored on ridging. Combining this information with the actual ice thickness distribution helps us to reconstruct a history of the ice properties. For example, here are three ice thickness distributions displayed from October, April and June. First, we can observe how the most frequent ice thickness class, the mode, has shifted from about half a meter over the winter to 1.7 meters in April and even 2.1 meters in June. This is a good indicator of the thermodynamic growth. When we look now at the April ITD, we see that there is quite some ice um, that is thinner than the mode. This ice has formed most likely in leads over the winter. On the other side, ridging has increased the mean thickness substantially and created large parts of the ice thicker than the mode. The next aim of our research is now to connect the temporal evolution of the ice properties to the time series of deformation events. This way we can quantify the effects of deformation on the ice thickness, which would enable us to better understand the future role of deformation in the changing Arctic climate system.